Welcome to Canada's podcast. At Silicon Valley Bank, we help innovative technology and life science companies grow. If you're ready to take your next step, discover how Silicon Valley Bank's founder-friendly financial solutions, industry insights, and connections can help you move your bold ideas forward fast. Go to www.svb.com slash Canada slash connect. Take your next step with Silicon Valley Bank. Hello, this is Robert Smigel, and welcome to the BC edition of Canada's podcast, where we talk to entrepreneurs who are making it happen here in British Columbia. Today's guest, Alison Taylor, the co-founder and co-CEO of Jane, an online platform for healthcare practitioners that delivers a unified approach to online booking, charting, scheduling, video services, and payments. Jane helps thousands of practitioners across the world with the business side of their practice so they can focus on what they do best, helping their clients. Well, Allison, welcome to Canada's podcast, and thanks for taking the time today to be here for all our listeners. Oh, thanks for including me. All right. Great. Okay, let's start off. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and give us the details on your current business. Sounds exciting. Yeah, how far back should we start? Oh, wow. I, the it, origin of Jane. Well, are you born and raised in Vancouver? Are you from Vancouver? Oh, you want to go all the way? I was born in London, England, actually. Ah, okay. Only because my mother is British and she went home to have me. Ah. Um, so then I came back to Canada. I think I was a week old. So I'm Canadian, born to Canadian parents. Like they were Canadians already, but then I was born in England. So awesome. born in Wimbledon, actually. Nice. Auspicious birth. And so uh, you start off as a massage therapist, right? Is that how you? No, I I am not a practitioner. My parents are both physiotherapists. Oh, okay. But I and I actually have an English literature degree with a minor in psychology. So I was just actually telling this to some of our new team members in our onboarding session this morning. I thought I was going to be a physio at one point. I thought I was going to be an English teacher. At no point did I think I was going to be the CEO of a tech company. That was not the. What do you want to be when you grow up? answer. Um, But here we are. I mean, I don't know if anyone ever knows the answer to that question all that clearly, because you only know about six careers when you're growing up. Did you host a podcast when you grew up? No, not until I started listening to them. Then I started going, you know what? I think I could do this. Yeah, it's funny. And I think it's odd that we ask our children that question. What do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, they literally know six things and half the jobs that are going to be available available to them aren't even invented yet. Right. So Let's just yeah. talk about what are you good at and then try to promote those skills in a human as they develop. And how you can adapt to the marketplace. I think it's yeah. also important, right? Yeah. You know, uh, if, yeah, yeah, as so you that, see things change. That is that is t- kind of the story. So I um, I went to school to be, I was in my in, at university um, doing my English lit degree. And then my one of my parents needed an office manager of their practice because their office manager quit on them very suddenly. And so I just said, I've been, you know, I've been doing reception for them there. For my whole life, I was filing paper medical charts for pocket money when I was, you know, 12 years old. Um, and so I just took over managing the clinic while I was at school and I really liked it. So then I was doing full-time school, full-time work. Um, and then when I graduated, I was like, I'm just going to keep doing this for a bit. Cause this is an actual, I mean, it's a real job running a medical practice, like a physiotherapy practice. It's a job. Uh, and I really was enjoying it. And then I brokered the purchase of a second practice to expand it. Um, And then I decided to open my own. So I was having babies throughout that time. And then by the time I was pregnant with my third, my midwives needed a place to work. They, they were not working out of an office at that time. So they were looking for an office space. And I knew a few physios that were looking for an office space. And so I was like, oh, I know how to run a clinic. I'll just, I'll just open something. And this is part of being, I think, young and somewhat naive is you don't really you're very optimistic, I think, when you're when you haven't experienced too much of life yet, which is a, a bonus. Um, so then I opened a practice. So I opened Canopy uh, in 2011, um, and then when I was looking for software, there was no software that existed that would suit a multidisciplinary clinic because I ended up having eight treatment rooms and I filled it with all these different types of practitioners. So there was an osteopath, an acupuncture, Cairo, midwives, physio. Um, counseling a little bit of everything in that one, in that one clinic. And so for medical charting and for uh, scheduling, there just 
most of the software was um, one one discipline specific and then not online, no online booking at the time. So my now co-founder, Trevor, he was doing the branding and building the website for my practice. And so he offered to build me something as part of my website. So that was the very first step in the Jane story uh, in that he he built it as part of my website. It was hosted on a Mac mini within my practice. Uh, and I just used it for a year and a half for all the charting and for the online booking. And then other people started asking us about it. So people could see the online booking. They're like, hey, I want to use this. What is this? What are you using? And then they started contacting him as well. And so then we partnered and built it out into a full system that included the whole billing component. So insurance billing management and payments. Um, and then we started licensing that in 2014. So that was, that's kind of the whole story in a very, in a, okay. in a few Now, years. did you need any financing uh, along the way? We didn't really know about um, the tech world of financing at the time because both of, both of us were just running small businesses. And in a small business, you get a loan for your startup costs. You open a business and you have to make money pretty quickly because you can't not make money and pay your, your team. And so we were both doing it sort of as, as a side project. So I was still working for the, my practice and he was still working for his marketing company. And so as we developed it, we just get you know, we had our, our day jobs. And so those paid us. And then we, we never had a free trial period. We had paying customers right away. And so we never had, we didn't need financing. We were profitable since the, since the beginning. And that was intentional because we had the small business mindset. Um, when we first learned in the tech world that people have a zero cash date, like a, a date where they're literally going to run out of money or a path to profitability. It was just such a foreign idea that you have a business that doesn't make money to pay your bills. So we wouldn't take on expense without having the income to pay them. So we would actually fight, like we would, our income would go up by a few thousand dollars and we would say, who gets a staff member? Like, do you get one on the product team or do I get one on the customer team? And I would always win because I would okay. fight harder. <laughs> so my team grew faster, but then we're always a little bit behind because of course you're signing up the customers to pay for the role and then they're creating volume and you don't have enough people yet. So you're always just a little bit behind. Um, okay. in the process. I want you to give me a key piece of knowledge or information about your industry that our listeners can learn from that they may not know about. I think it's most interesting that people don't consider healthcare practices small businesses, or they're not really aware that they're small businesses in the same way that other small businesses maybe are viewed. So these are owner operators. They're running their, they're working their day where they're doing their, their care, treating patients. And then around that, they're having to run a whole small business. And usually a small business owner is spending their nine to five running their small business, but these healthcare providers have to do it around their work day. And so it's a lot of invisible work that I think people don't recognize is happening when they visit a healthcare practice and it's kind of lonely. So I think that they're, uh, I, I think a lot of people just don't consider healthcare as a small business space, but it really is. Okay. As far as Jane, what is the long-term vision and what will your company look like in the future? Do you see the company expanding into other areas and where beyond Vancouver, BC, or even Canada? Yeah, we're already international. So we're, we're working with 60,000 practitioners now. Um, I think that was the most recent count. And we're all around North America, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, primarily, and then a smattering throughout the rest of the world. Um, whenever we are picked up in another country, we, we send a translation file to a, the new practice and we say, here's all the, all the words that we need, all the phrases we need in order to provide Jane in your language. And then they fill it out, send it back. And then the patient facing side can all be in whatever language they're in. Um, so we are already around the world, but the plan is definitely to continue to grow and expand. We, our mission is to help the helpers and uh, we do that through delightful product, delightful service. So I say when you come to, jo to join Jane, it's not just a product, but our team is your team. You're getting a team of cheerleaders. You're getting a real human group of people. And then you're also getting a delightful product. And so our goal is that that community continues to grow and that we expand the helpful offerings to that community. So we might expand into different product offerings, but we also want to expand into different verticals. So what that means is our vertical of allied health is actually made up of multiple verticals. So there'd be chiropractors, physios, massage service, all of these are small verticals within our overall market. 
Um, but we keep getting pulled into new ones. So for a good example of that is just at the beginning of the pandemic, um, mental health practitioners suddenly needed to go online. Like, And mental health practitioners tended to not be very comfortable with software or with technology. It's much more of an in-person, it was much more of an in, in-person style of practice. And I think a lot of them are still taking checks. And I don't know if you've ever tried to book online with a, a mental health care practitioner, but it probably wasn't possible. Yeah. And then all of a sudden their world changed very dramatically overnight and they could no longer practice in, in person. And so then mental health practitioners became our fastest growing vertical overnight. Um, and so that just shifted pretty dramatically. So then we're just like, okay, Jane needs to be a delightful experience for mental health practitioners. So we shifted our roadmap a little bit to try and accommodate that. But we see that happening. That's happened in a few different disciplines in the past, and we're still seeing that happening now. So we I call them our on deck disciplines. There's certain disciplines that we are seeing increased traction in, and then we'll shift our focus a little bit and make sure the product's delightful for them. But 90% of Jane works for everybody exactly the same. And there's just 10% of the features that maybe aren't make people feel like, oh, it's not for me. And we want everyone to feel like this is for me. The team at Silicon Valley Bank in Canada can help you move your bold ideas forward fast, bringing global expertise to founders, investors, and innovators. Visit www.svb.com slash Canada slash connect to find out more. Okay, well, we learned a little bit about you and your business. So we want to talk about British Columbia and doing business and what that looks like for you. What are the biggest benefits for you being an entrepreneur here in Vancouver, BC? I want you to give us some of the good points about starting a company here, but I also want you to give us some of the tough things or challenges you've encountered yeah. so our listeners can learn from them. I I think being a Canadian company and being a beast, like a Canadian company overall, I think is a huge advantage. And I think that a lot of people don't talk about why that is. Um, and for us, definitely a big advantage is that Canada is a very friendly ecosystem. As Vancouver is a super friendly tech ecosystem, a business ecosystem. So you're very well supported. People are very generous with their knowledge. They're very generous with their stories. And those are super invaluable. But even more than that, you get to build your business in a more... Uh, it's an easier environment to build your business than trying to start in the US. So let's... Obviously, the US is a... It's geographically close and it's a very large market. Trying to start a business in the U.S., I think, is a lot harder than starting a business in Canada. And so we got to build out a more complete product before we launched in the U.S. than someone would if they started in the U.S. Uh, and it just gives you like a friendly environment to get past that initial minimum viable product where you can then launch internationally with, I think, greater success because you're farther along in your, in your development journey and even in your just learnings as a business. You're just farther along. Okay. So we so call massage therapy our seed money um, because we took off really quickly in massage therapy in BC. So I think we have like over 90% market share of massage therapists in BC. And so they really funded a lot of our early development and our of our early story. And then as we add on more layers, our new customer bases are sort of, you know, they're funding the continued growth of the company. But starting here for sure, was a, it was definitely a benefit. Some of the challenges? Um, I'm sure every single VC company is saying the same thing right now, but as, um, well, especially tech companies as San Francisco has decentralized, uh, people are hiring all over the place and Vancouver is also wooing international headquarters and companies to come and set up shop in Vancouver. Uh, and they're often providing them tax breaks or funding. But what happens when they bring in these like really large companies who are sucking up multiple, like many jobs, thousands of jobs, is that it's um, it's negatively impacting the startups and small businesses and that are trying to hire from that same pool locally. So I think there do, there needs to some work needs to be done to help accommodate the fact that if we're going to be wooing these companies to come and take talent, we need to be doing something to support the, the businesses also trying to draw from that same talent pool. And then the, the decentralization of the San Francisco companies is also bumping up um, salaries. So I would say that that's probably the biggest challenge. Okay, which segues nicely into my next question for you. We get a lot of immigration in Canada. Mm -hmm. So you, this next question, I want you to speak to them. If you were to start all over again and you just moved here to Vancouver, BC, but this time you don't know anyone, 
knowing what you know now, what would you do and how would you go about starting all over again as an entrepreneur? Starting a new business if I was an immigrant? Yeah. You just came to Canada. You're basically driving down Oak Street from the airport and you're thinking, I'm going to start a business. Mm. Knowing what you know now, what would be your kind of first thing you'd do? Um, well, I'll just tell you what was successful for Jane, getting Jane off the ground. And it would probably be the same for you as an immigrant entrepreneur. Um, one is there's a there's many, many um, startup accelerators. Uh, BC Tech has a great program if you're if you're looking to build a technical company. And that's my experience. So that's what I'm going to be able to speak to. Um, and we were also part of a competition called New Ventures BC. And getting into these programs and into these, they put you in um, in a position to be more widely known um, by the investment community. And so, even without doing any work, you become on, you get on lists. And so, if you're looking to grow an investment style company, that definitely is an easy way to do it. But there's also a ton of government programs and support that it's worth looking into. And you don't even know they. Ex- you just would never know they existed unless you did some real work digging around. Their names are a bit confusing. There, there's provincial programs, there's federal programs, but there is a lot of provincial support for um, people looking to start businesses. And I, w- I wish I could send out some resources for you, but I, we've benefited from, from one called the Western Economic Division. I think they just mm-hmm. changed the name from that. Um, but we got a grant, which was non-repayable um, because I'm a woman founder that helped us advertise in California. And you just put together projects and then you have to apply for them. And they're pretty, uh, it's not its not super hard to apply. Uh, and they're, they really, really genu- genuinely want to champion businesses. So I would explore the government options for sure. Okay. Let's talk about your routine. Uh, what's the first hour look like for you when you get up in the morning? Do you have a specific routine or ritual that gets you motivated to start your day? I have three children who are currently going to three different schools. So my routine currently is just trying to get my youngest up, fed, and out the door to the school bus at 7.15 in the morning. Um, I, I don't think... The, word, the term self-care kind of bothers me because I'm like, are you kidding? I don't have time for self-care. I know all these founders and entrepreneurs are like, and then I would take time for yourself. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. Start start at 5 a.m. Work yeah. out of the gym. I'm like, yeah. I, would, I, I don't know how to do that right now when I have three children and a business and a dog and um, I barely can make food. I have to clean up the kitchen before I can make the next meal. So currently my routine there's okay. nothing. There's nothing helpful in there. It's coping. Okay. There's coping. Let's talk about how you educate yourself. What books are you reading now, and why? Or even audio books and or podcasts. And can you recommend any books for our listeners who are also entrepreneurs? I love. I love reading. I have. I have an English lit background. Obviously, it's part of um, my story. But for business books, um, right now, we're, I'm reading "Making of a Manager." If you are new to management, it's a fantastic resource. We're going to actually do it as a bit of a book club for all of our new managers within our company. Uh, That's by Julie Zhao, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. I also just read Bad Blood, which is the book about the Theranos story, which is super fascinating. Um, And I've taken to actually listening to books, audio books, because I can clean my kitchen and do laundry while I listen to them or while you're driving. So it's a... It's a really good way to get those business books in. Um, but one of my favorites that I referenced a lot is, and I should get the title right, Who You Are, What You Do Is Who You Are, or Who You Are Is What You Do. It's the good to great uh, se- sequel. That yeah. Was- I'm not trying to think who that I'm author is, too. It's, um, it's the Andreessen Horowitz partner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more about um, the culture, company culture, and but it's wonderful. It's easy to flip through. Um, and then the high growth handbook. There's so many. I feel like I just need to give you, send you a list, put in your call notes. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Send us a list. We'll put that out there. If you weren't doing what you do now, what would you like to do for a profession? That is an excellent question. I have the perfect job. I, nothing. I would do this. Um, I, I just know that every whatever I do, I need to be doing something that I'm learning and doing new things all the time. Anything that's stagnant or just where you, you know, some people just like to perfect what they do and then be really good at it and just 
do the same thing all day, every day, that would, that would not work very well for, for my brain. Um, so I, I think I'm doing this because I've crafted myself the perfect job, which it's, is super fun. And so much I'm doing an MBA every day, which is just amazing, but okay. no, I have no good answer for you. If I wasn't doing this, I don't know what I'd be doing. You know, someone once told me payments was in their blood. They were like, they yeah. left the world of payments and then came back to payments because they couldn't leave it. It was their heart. And so I was wondering that about myself. Is it healthcare? Is it small business? Is it tech? Like what part of my job is it that is in my blood? And I, I actually haven't teased it apart enough yet to answer that question. I think it's, I think it's small business healthcare, something in this space. Yeah. In business, what is your favorite word, quote, or sentence that you like to use? There's something you say all the time your employees so. uh, there has become so many i think right now the one i'm really liking is that people feel respected when they're given voice and choice and i think that's true across our customer base our team my family there's so many things that are raising kids and running a business are actually very similar there's tons of things that are are parallel but giving people feel respected when they're given voice and choice and so if you can involve people early and give them a voice um, it really helps with smoothing out the process of making things happen. That's, I think, one thing I say all the time. And then I say, I always talk about um, explaining the why. People always say, like Ali says, you got to explain the why. Why are we doing this? Why is this important? Why do I care? I'm um, getting to the why. Although I have not read Simon Sinek's book, but I should, because it's probably very central to how I think about things. What's your least favorite word or sentence you do not like to hear? In business. In business. Um, I think it's pretty common for founders, but telling me I can't do something. Uh, I don't like that at all. My mom, I don't actually like being told what to do at all. My mom said when I was little, she used to have to always give me the last little bit. So she'd be like, go lie on your bed as a punishment. And I'd be like, can I sit on the stairs? She'd say, no. I'm like, can I just sit outside my room? She'd say, no. Can I sit on the bed? No. Or she'd be like, yes, you'd have to give me the last thing or it was just a disaster. I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> okay. Do you have any advice that you may have received that you can pass on to Entrepreneurs Throughout Canada? Has someone ever told you something along your journey that you oh, resonated with you that said, you know what? I could so, use that. So many things. I think for me... And I think one of the things that we've learned through this journey, especially, is that your business is not going to necessarily look like everyone else's. So just make sure that you're filtering advice through what you are most excited about and what you get passionate about. So we've scaled our business entirely through a product customer focus. And so we, ha we don't have a sales team. Our marketing spend currently is only 5%. But we were a lot of advice we were given early was often about adding sales very early on, but we were like, Oh, we're just our, this is what we're excited about. And, um, we were just reading over our values document with our new hires today. And we realized that our first two values involve being respectful, like loving the product and loving the customers. And that's been our whole growth strategy from the very beginning. And I don't think anyone would tell you that not having a sales team is a good growth strategy, but it's worked really well for us. And so just being really com comfortable and confident that the areas that excite you about your business, it's okay to scale. It's, you can just dig into that and it's okay if it's not the way everyone else is doing it. Okay. So we're going to wrap things up, Allison. How can our listeners get hold of you? And is there anything you'd like to add before you leave us today? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. So you, you can probably, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a very good poster on LinkedIn, but I am on there. Um, or you're always welcome to email me. I'm Allison at jane.app. That's probably dangerous to do on here, but. Okay. What the heck? I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a lot of sales emails. Yeah. Um, and what would I like? Yeah, I, I'm my biggest um, piece of advice to anyone building a business is just also to be like really comfortable with telling people you're learning because. Whenever we, whenever I enter a conversation and I say, I don't actually know anything about, I've never done this before. I say that all the time. I've never done this before. Can you tell me what that acronym means? Or like, you know, there's areas in your business where you do have to be an expert. So you shouldn't go into an area that you should be the expert 
saying, I don't know how to do this. <clears throat> but if it's, if you're not supposed to be the expert yet, that's fine. Just ask the questions. People really respect that a lot more than posturing or pretending you know everything. So. Yeah, I think some people feel that they're going to expose themselves. I think if they're trying to be a CEO or try how C level no, executive, and then they oh, say something uh, like that, they're going to be like, you know, uh, oh, you know my God, uh, every, you don't know what that every, is? Everybody is faking it everywhere. Like, we're, everyone's just doing their best, and they're all, everyone's human. Everyone is human. And you know more about you and your story than anyone else. You will always be the expert on that. Uh, it's totally okay to say that you don't know certain things. It, it doesn't make you look weak. It actually, I think, often can show emotional maturity. So yeah. don't be afraid to ask questions like, oh, this is what you've done for your whole career. Tell me what should I know about it? Like people are very happy to share their knowledge with you if you ask. They've been through it. Yeah. And right? you have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would, you, you, should, you should know more about that than them. They should know more. Okay, Allison, thanks for coming on the show. I've learned a lot about you, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. And to all our listeners who listen to Allison's story, thanks for listening to Canada's podcast. Like, comment, and subscribe to all our channels to get the latest podcasts from entrepreneurs across Canada. And we will see you next time. The Silicon Valley Bank team in Canada can help you take your next step. Find out more about the bank that has nearly 40 years of global experience supporting venture-backed tech and life science companies and their investors. We're in Canada to help leading innovators reach the next stage faster. Visit www.svb.com slash Canada slash connect. Take your next step with Silicon Valley Bank.